Hey there, everyone. Will Dupree in the KXAN Live studio. We are about to carry a live town hall here in just a moment from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. They, of course, are going to be focusing their conversation and the experts you're seeing there on the COVID-19 threat. We do know now that there are five confirmed cases outside of those people who were repatriated from Wuhan, China. Those cases are in Harris and Fort Bend County, and all five of those people were on the same trip to Egypt. That all was confirmed yesterday, and we share that with us uh, on our website, KXAN.com and the KXAN News app. Let's take a listen as they get started underway. Um, I'm hearing the comments begin in my ear, so let's, let's take a listen. Again, this is a town hall happening at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. in everyone's mind uh, since early January of this uh, calendar year. Uh, we are having this opportunity for our employees and uh, others in our community, uh, people who are in school here, people who are faculty members and others, to have a first-hand opportunity uh, to ask our own experts what they think about this. And I keep using the word our experts, they, they are worldwide experts who happen to hold faculty positions here at UTMB. Uh, we'll lead off with some of those who are on the specific science side. We will go through the clinical areas. We'll also go through the, the educational area and uh, there will be ample time to talk about things such as how is this virus spread, what is it, uh, how do we treat it in the future, and what level of worry should you uh, exhibit? First of all, we would ask you to do a couple things. Don't panic. Now, say that with me. Don't panic. <laughs> okay? Panic never helps solve anything, and those of us in medicine know that. Keeping a calm, clear, and focused mind is what is required. Uh, this is not something we at UTMB are particularly afraid of, or nor is it something that we are overdue worried about because we understand the characteristics of that and we know that prevention is, is as simple as washing your hands. So we are going to talk about those things today. We hope this information will be reassuring for you and not adding to your own sleepless nights. If anything, uh, we hope it will be something that's instructive and helps you deal with the days ahead because it's likely that uh, this issue will become more and more complex. I want to lead off with uh, Dr. Jim Ledoux, uh, and we're gonna go straight down the line today for the, uh, for the most part, uh, mainly because we only have one changer for our slides and stuff like that, so I want you to watch and see if they're using good uh, hand washing technique between passes at the time, okay? Uh, they are not, uh... <laughs> thank you, Dr. Kaiser. In, in addition to being a faculty member here, Dr. Kaiser is also the local health authority for Galveston County, so he has to set a good example. Dr. LeDuc uh, is head of our Galveston National Laboratory, where biosafety level four research and the kind of research that uh, this particular virus requires is based. So, Dr. LeDuc, can you tell us a bit about what we're dealing with? Yes, if I can get the right slide up, I should. There we go. Okay, history of coronavirus. And so I, this is not going to be a lecture. It's just a, a couple of key points. Number one, coronaviruses have been known to science for a long, long time as a cause of common, uh, common respiratory diseases, a common cold. So we know a fair bit of it. That we've probably all been exposed to a coronavirus in our lifetime, and we're all here to talk about it. So that's kind of the background. Since about 2003, we've seen new coronaviruses that cause very severe disease in some populations, starting with SARS and then the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, and now this most recent uh, new coronavirus. The scientific community has known about this group of viruses for quite some time, especially after SARS, and investigations have shown that there's a lot of these viruses that exist in nature, some of which have the ability to transmit person to person. So we've known that this was a risk for a long time. It looks like bats are the most likely reservoir host for this. So the, 
the point on all of this is simply that this is a virus that has emerged from nature. There's nothing exciting about it other than it's new to the human population, but it's been around for quite some time. So some of the research that's underway uh, here on campus, everybody's talking about diagnostic testing. Well, we've been working on this for quite some time. We're working in close partnership with our clinical laboratory to establish a diagnostic test. That work is underway right now, and we hope to have that completed very, very soon. In addition, we in the GNL have the capability to test large numbers of specimens should the need arise. And so we're standing that capability up as well. So that will also be available very soon. As far as therapeutics are concerned, there's a number of antiviral drugs that are already on the market. We're now testing to see if those work against this new virus. We have the virus in the laboratory, and a number of investigators are working on that, uh, that process. We're also looking at the virus to try and discover new uh, candidate drugs that might be efficacious in the treatment of this. So more on that later. Vaccines, you've probably all heard Dr. Fauci say it's going to take a year or more to make it. He's not lying. It will take a year or more to make a vaccine. We have several candidates, sorry, <laughs> several candidates uh, that are being examined in the laboratory to, uh, to advance the, the uh, vaccine development. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but it's very exciting work, very promising. And Dr. Xi may say some more specifically about that. Dr. Xi's laboratory and others, uh, our animal resource group, have done a tremendous job in developing some very specific tools that allow us to do cutting edge research on this group of viruses. And without going into details, this is really exciting work and really puts UTMB at the forefront of the national uh, response to this. Uh, finally, uh, we were fortunate to have access to the very first isolate that was made in the United States from the case you'll, you'll recall in Washington. That has gone to the World Reference Center that Dr. Weaver heads, and we, through that reference center, we shared that virus with a number of researchers across the country and around the world, as well as the diagnostic industry and the uh, uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical industry as the uh, continue their investigation. So that's kind of a, a quick update on where we stand. And I guess infection control. So I, I think I would just just take a one minute to, to, to describe, just highlight one of the breakthrough experiments ongoing and occurred in UTMB campus. We developed reverse genetic system already for the new coronavirus. That means we will be uh, we are able to man make manipulate this virus on the petri dish, and this is a really really important tool for everything we're going to do to handle this virus. We can understand the mutations of the history of this virus, how that contributes to the evolution of the virus, and jump from species to species to human. We will be able to manipulate the virus to develop vaccines, to understand which regions causing the disease so that we'll be able to make vaccines and the therapeutics. And then also for drug discoveries, we need to be able to identify the target of the therapeutics and that this system will provide a perfect tool to understand that and therapeutics and, and diagnostic too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Uh, next is Dr. Janik Patel who heads our uh, Infection Control and Healthcare e Epidemiology Division. Dr. Patel. Thank you. So I'll also make a few, you know, remarks. So first of all, right now, uh, COVID is coronavirus-19. Uh, really, we don't have any treatments, right, or vaccines. So what are we left with is infection control. So this is really the backbone of the entire effort in terms of uh, how we can further contain this epidemic is really to infection control practices. So a couple of points on this first slide, which is about what you can do uh, in the general public arena, and that is, these are all common sense things, you probably read about them. Uh, avoid close contacts with people who are sick. Uh, avoid touching your nose, eyes, and mouth, because it really the virus primarily spreads to the respiratory tract. And stay home if you are sick. Um, cover your you know, cough and sneeze with tissue, 
So keep some tissue handy if you really have some symptoms and uh, throw it promptly in trash. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using a regular household cleaner or spray at home, especially if you are ill. Um, and wash your hands uh, often with soap and water. This is the backbone of infection control. This is how you prevent infections uh, due to any pathogen. So we got to remember that and wash you know, your hands with soap and water with at least 20 seconds. And you know, we often run out of these uh, alcohol gels and gel sanitizers. You don't need them if you have soap and water, please. That's still is not a shortage item, I believe. You can still buy soap in Walmart. Okay. <laughs> so again, common sense things you have heard before. Just remember that. Uh, what to do if you really are diagnosed to have this particular disease? Uh, we don't have a case here in our system. I know we have three in Houston area. If you have a disease, lots of us are going to be involved. Okay, you're not going to learn from this slide what you're going to do. All right, we're going to have health department educate you, our doctors educate you about what to do next. But if you're mild disease, really, you're going to be staying home. We're not going to ask you to uh, be hospitalized. That's the important thing to remember. And once you're home, you're going to give, be given really proper instructions, primarily to health department who will be monitoring you, together with your physicians. And this is the general guidance about what you'll be asked to do, which is separate yourself from other people and animals in your home. So you may go to a separate room. I've known of families that have abandoned their loved ones in China, in other places. So, you know, uh, you may be the only one at home. Anyway, so you, you will, you will um, be isolating yourself in a room. You will call ahead to visit a clinic. You'll be wearing a mask. Um, even in your home, if you move around, cover your cough and sneeze, that is uh, obvious, and clean your hands often. You will not be sharing your personal items with others in your household. And in your house, you are going to be cleaning all high touch surfaces every day. Again, you can use any household disinfectant that you have at home. Uh, and you'll be monitoring your symptoms. And obviously, if you've been diagnosed with this condition, you will have ability to work with your healthcare provider. I want to show you this slide, which is, uh, have you seen a surgical mask recently? <laughs> they have been disappearing. So one quick message I want to give you. Please use these supplies judiciously. We have enough on hand, and I know this comment will be made later on. Um, but we have heard complaints already on several units and clinics. They put a new box, and it's gone. So please safeguard your supplies. They shouldn't be sitting out in an open area, including in patient care areas. Okay? I was making rounds yesterday, and I saw I got complaints that families were grabbing these things. Right? So please. Safeguard this. These are precious right now. So surgical mask is good enough for droplet precaution. The N95 respirator mask, which is the, the big one over there, the round one, is meant for uh, protection against certain airborne pathogens. All right, so TB and chickenpox are the ones we have been using it. Now it's for coronavirus as well. So this will be when you are actually evaluating a suspect case. If you don't have a 95 mask, don't panic. Use the surgical mask. Okay? So... Uh, just be prepared. Um, this is uh, how you will be dressed up, okay, when you have um, a case that you are evaluating or even managing a patient, inpatient. This is both for outpatient and inpatient. So if you have screening patient in the clinic and you know now they have high risk behavior right now, which is travel and sick contacts, uh, you will be gowning and gloving up, and there will be some process described later on. Many clinics are going to be equipped to do that, and lots of people have been trained for the N95 fit testing. Still, a lot of fit testing is going on because we have a lot of employees that are demanding it throughout our system. So again, be judicious with your supplies, and we will get to as many people as possible with N95 fit testing. So those are the brief comments I wanted to make for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on uh, for our first discussion on uh, what does this disease look like during clinical presentation. Dr. Gulshan Sharma, our chief medical officer for our, uh, our hospitals, will uh, take those uh, series of uh, uh, questions for you. Thanks, Dr. Raymer. So the reported illness to date have ranged from uh, mild symptoms to severe illnesses and death. So all of you are aware of that. 
and the symptoms appear within 2 to 14 days after exposure. And most common symptoms are cough, fever, and shortness of breath. So it is often hard to distinguish this illness compared to your regular flu. That's where the worry comes for most individuals. So most patients, so this is a comforting fact, 80% of the patient experience mild illness. You will have some scratchy throat, low-grade fever for a few days, and you will just resolve. And this is mostly in healthy individuals who do not have underlying comorbidities or a coexisting illness. There is a potential of severe symptoms that occur during the second week of illness. This is actually the differentiating point between coronavirus and flu. So most folks who had flu, it comes very sudden. Within 24 to 48 hours, you start spiking high fever, you have diffuse myalgias. That is how flu presents. If you look at the bottom graph there, the onset of symptoms, then most people do not get into hospitalization or ICU in the second week of that illness. That's a differentiating fact between the coronavirus and what we know about coronavirus and what we know about flu. And the patients who are older age and those with comorbidities are at high risk and have poor outcome. Most healthy individuals just tolerate this fine. Now, here is the difference between COVID-19 and the seasonal flu. Similar symptoms spread through droplet infection, but they are caused by different viruses. And the death rate from influenza is 0.1%, and the death rate from that is COVID-19 is 1.5 to 2%. So I'm going to pay some attention to that, but a lot of people are focusing on what is the mortality with coronavirus. So I tell people, if you die, it's 100%. <laughs> Okay, so, so it is anybody's guess. So what are you going to do differently? It is 1% or 2% or 3% or 4%. So I think we are focusing too much on mortality from this virus than actually focusing on prevention and actually focusing on containment of this illness. So I would encourage you just focus on prevention and containment. The mortality rates is going to come after the fact. We may not know the true mortality from this virus until it's about six to nine months out. So every day it is changing. So this particular graph on the other side is basically uh, from February 22nd. So we still have endemic flu throughout United States. The CDC estimated 32 million cases of flu this year, and we have 310,000 hospitalization with 18,000 deaths with flu where we have vaccine, where we have testing, and where we can tell people every year what to do. So I just want to make sure we put flu and coronavirus in context. So this is a nice map, and I think you can all able to see this. This is, I accessed this just two days ago. This is from Johns Hopkins, and they're doing an excellent job. And I think by today, it was a close to 100,000 cases throughout the world, and there were about 3,300 deaths. So this actually tracks uh, internationally the number of cases and number of deaths in terms of helping us understand the epidemic of this illness. So this is another interesting slide to look at. The, what is the infectivity rate that if you, have, if you are sick or you get, to sick, you get to expose to a sick individual, how many individuals it can transmit to? So the most infectious virus we have is measles. So one case of measles can affect, infect about 15 to 16 individuals. So you saw it is way far on the right, depending upon how you're looking at. And then on that y-axis is the mortality in a logarithmic scale. So common cold is 1 to 1.2. So flu is basically every one person usually infect about one person. For coronavirus, it is close to 1 to 2.2 or about 2 individuals. So that is the infectious rate for a coronavirus. When you look at the MERS and uh, uh, Ebola and bird flu, their infectivity rate is less than 1. But the mortality rate is much higher in those illnesses compared to what is in um, COVID-19. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands the infectivity rate in terms of this virus. Now, a lot of people know recently there is a S form and an L form, and that it, they have a very different infectivity rate and how serious the illness is. This. So if anybody has any question more about that, I'll be happy to address it uh, later. 
I do want also to comment uh, your colleague there, uh, Dr. Susan McClellan, on treatment. So just a little bit about how we're handling these cases. So I'm director of biocontainment unit. We are not assuming that any case that's hospitalized will need to go into the biocontainment unit. That, as long as cases are low, that may be what we will do. But as you're all quite aware, there are cases in other hospitals that do not have biocontainment units that are being taken care of, and the CDC does not recommend biocontainment level care. So if we do it, it is in some ways because that's a convenient place uh, as much as anything else. But our team, however, is engaged in making sure that we or whoever else cares for a patient has access to the best options if someone becomes severely ill. So many people have heard that we have no specific therapies, stay home, ibuprofen, et cetera, and so on. And that's true until someone becomes very ill. Uh, the reason this messaging is important to me is that I've heard people say, don't even bother to call your doctor. They don't want to see it. They'll just talk to you on the phone. And this is inappropriate. If there's a reason to think that you might have COVID-19, you should call your doctor who can hopefully help you go through the person that we kind of skipped here, uh, Dr. Kaiser, and through the health system to determine if testing is appropriate and also to get advice on when, if you are tested or even if you're just isolated or uh, quarantined, to decide that you need to come in for medical care. As was mentioned, people may get much more ill during the second week of illness and we want people to be aware of that if COVID is what they have so that they will know that they need to be prepared to call if they get worse and we need to prepare to take care of them. So there are not specific FDA-approved therapies, and that is true. There are several, however, which have uh, been used experimentally for other indications and have evidence that they would be very effective for coronavirus. And we are engaging with the NIH to be part of a trial to assay those so that we can find out if indeed they work well for coronavirus and, uh, and even to have an, uh, access directly by the company if necessary. So, there are specific therapeutics that we can offer. We don't know 100% about them, but we are preparing to be part of the research endeavor as well on the clinical side. Uh, and we also have a research protocol to collect specimens and data from patients which can feed back into the research enterprise in the lab. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Uh, could you tell us just briefly about the special unit for treatment of uh, individuals who have really severe cases of coronavirus that we have developed here on the UTMB campus? Uh, sure, so our biocontainment unit is one of 10 federally funded regional Ebola and special pathogens treatment centers, which is RESPTCS. And if you can say that, you can put it to a tune if you prefer, uh, but it, it takes a little practice. But anyway, there are 10 federally funded that match the 10 HHS uh, regions in the country. Uh, we are the one for five states, so Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, get right, Oklahoma, New Mexico. Um, and uh, so, um, and we are supported to be always prepared to accept patients who have the most uh, communicable and most deadly diseases such as Ebola. So we practice routinely to be able to handle these patients in a manner which both provides the most excellent possible medical care that we can provide as well as completely safeguards our staff and the rest of the public. So uh, honestly, uh, this is kind of the best place to be if you get one of these diseases uh, and the best place to be if you happen to live in the community <laughs> and one of the diseases in the community. But so we uh, have uh, quarterly trainings. Our staff is uh, sort of ready to go at any time and um, we are at Basically, we work with the, both federal government and other partners, as well as our other units, again, to prepare for excellent clinical care, as well as clinical research, uh, so that we can not only provide care, but collect information for the next time. Uh, Dr. McClellan, would it be safe to say that uh, most hospitals would be able to care for a, uh, a COVID-19 patient uh, without going in that special unit? Correct, and in fact, that, that's as, as I mentioned before, there are plenty of other hospitals that are taking care of these patients, not in the level of high containment that we would be able to provide with someone with, for example, Ebola. We, uh, as I said, we might use the unit, 
uh, if we get patients for convenience, but care can be provided by any hospital that can provide the medical level of care necessary. So, um, so other hospitals have them and they're not being routed directly or specifically here. Dr. Kaiser, could you help us put this uh, in perspective for the community health and uh, in your role also as a health authority for the, uh, the county of Galveston? Uh, what can people do? What can they expect regarding uh, need for isolation or uh, stopping travel, things like that? Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. So I think the first thing we have to do is to put it in perspective is how many cases are there in Galveston County? And the answer is none. We have no cases to date. There have been five cases that have been identified in the region. All of them have been associated with travel. So what that means is that today, we have no evidence that there's local spread. Now that may change tomorrow, but as of today, we have no evidence that there is, is local spread. So that's uh, very, very good news. Um, one of the questions that I, I keep getting is that, oh, we heard, we heard that you had a patient who might have it. And, and the answer is, is that we're working people up all the time for this virus. Some of them are really kind of silly. Some of them are very serious in that they, they have real risk factors and we're concerned about them and, and we test them. But to date, um, no one has come back positive. And so if, uh, we, you know, we've heard uh, questions, things like, well, you've got people quarantined and, and hidden away. And that's not true either. We have nobody under a, we don't, we don't have anybody under a, uh, under a, uh, under a control order um, within the county. Now, when people get sick, we will ask them, please stay home, please stay where you are. And thus far, everyone has been extraordinarily cooperative. People who, who are concerned that they have this, they want to know, and they're, they're, they're doing what we ask them to do. Uh, there may come a time where if someone is positive, we will uh, put them in isolation, and we will probably quarantine their close contacts after we do an investigation just to see uh, where things are. With regard to travel, um, we're recommending people to reconsider uh, travel at, at this point. It, is that because something bad might happen to you? Well, in the general rule of thumb, probably not. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're planning a trip to go to uh, Italy, uh, that may not be a good thing, because you may not come, be able to come home. You know, and, and we, we've actually had some staff here at UTMB who, who went on a vacation trip to Italy, and then the virus hit. And uh, now they're in, in self-isolation uh, as well. Um, people have asked me, what about spring break? And I think, it's a great idea. Come to Galveston. I'm being dead serious because out there on the beach, you're not crowded. You've got nice sea breezes blowing everything away. The salt water can, can help uh, dissolve the viruses. So think of options that don't necessarily involve flying places and, and doing other things as well. I want to reiterate the importance of hand hygiene and just being mindful of what you're doing, particularly as healthcare workers. I think one of the big dangers we have is, you know, we go see a patient and get that mask off and those glasses off. What did I do? I just contaminated myself, right? You know? So you have to be very, very mindful of that. In terms of our preparations, we've been working with UTMB since day one. Uh, January 19th when the first case hit the United States. We've also been working with the other hospitals. We've been working with uh, the uh, EMT system as well. Um, we've had meetings with schools. We've had some schools ask us, do we need to cancel schools? And we go, not yet. All right. Now again, things like that may change. If this comes through, it will follow sort of a, a course where initially we'll see a phase where we have isolated cases. Then we'll see phases where we have multiple cases. And then we might see a generalized epidemic. And it's when you get to that generalized epidemic that you really are looking at things like um, restricting having mass gatherings and such. And, and we've, we're working with the school systems and we're working with other agencies to develop plans for doing this. What we're telling the schools and parents, I'm going to tell you the same thing. If a kid's sick, don't send them to school. Okay? And what we're telling the school systems is that if someone sends a sick kid to school, put them in a room somewhere else and call the parents and send them home. And uh, don't go to work if you're sick. And we're telling uh, all the employers throughout the region, come up with some liberal leave policies for people who are sick. Why is that important? We don't want people going, I, I can't miss work because I'll get in trouble. I can't miss work because I'll use my vacation time. I can't miss work because I'll lose pay. So 
No, UTMB has a, has a good policy, and we're encouraging other places uh, to do that as well and also develop a work-at-home uh, um, option. So where we are today, I think we're in a good spot. We've done a lot of planning. We've had some dry runs with the patients who have not had coronavirus. The system's working well. I think we're very well prepared. And I think the important thing is to, to get ready and think about how things might develop. The other thing that might develop, though, is that as the weather gets warmer, we may see this decrease. We don't know that, so don't count on it. But it may decrease, which will be a good thing. But if that happens, then we also have to worry about it coming back when it gets cold again. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm going to pass the torch over to our uh, Executive Vice President and Provost, Dr. Charles Mouton, uh, regarding the academic enterprise and the impact on it, Dr. Mouton. Uh, thank you, President Raymer. Um, you, you've heard from our colleagues about what we're doing with the community and with the clinical enterprise. We're now going to switch gears and talk a little bit about our educational enterprise and academic enterprise. Uh, this is guidance for students. So if you're working with students, talking to students, if you are a student, uh, you need to know the individual school's uh, possible excuse the absence because if a student is sick, an individual, this is that so the first phase that Dr. Kaiser just described, uh, they need to follow the school's excuse absent policy. That means you should be contacting the school's associate or assistant, uh, dean for student affairs, contacting, in some cases, your uh, faculty member and course director, and letting them know that you're sick and will be absent. We don't want you coming to group activities sick. And that group activity can be anything from a small, problem-based learning group, anywhere to an exam. Do not come to campus if you are sick. Now repeat. <laughs> Students, you gotta repeat it twice, remember. <laughs> you should not be coming to campus if you are sick. Um, but you do need to be responsible and contact the administration of your school to let them know. Uh, students who are planning to travel for international locations, this should be on hold to further notice. You should not be traveling uh, internationally, and, and Dr. Raymond will talk a little bit more about that. Domestic travel, I'm going to ask you if you're a student to clear that with your, off, your dean's office and the president's office, and we'll have uh, methods and forms for you to do so. If things get worse, if we get to the epidemic <coughs> pandemic phase of this, uh, we are ready from an education institution to put in place our educational continuity plan, which will mean remote instruction. So you will not be coming to campus for classes or for instruction or exams. These will be handled at home or in a location where you can be isolated away from other contact with individuals who may or may not be sick. Uh, you'll be given instructions by your individual school work with your assistant associate dean for academic affairs and student affairs, as well as your dean, uh, to understand the process and also, they will also let you know when you can return to campus when this uh, epidemic, pandemic period is over. Do not expect that you're gonna get into the library or into the HEC. We will close those buildings to avoid spread of the virus. You will not be allowed in those buildings because we don't want you infecting others and leaving virus shedding all over the building. So those buildings will be closed. Again, if a student is ill, we don't want you running to the student health service. However, we want you, as instructed previously, call ahead. Particularly, you can call, again, your associate assistant dean for student affairs or to student health service. Uh, they will evaluate you, and if there is further diagnostic testing or evaluation as needed, um, we, we will ask you to go to one of our UTMB locations that will be ready to provide service to you in, uh, in testing. This is fluid, so at this point, these are the locations that we have available for students. If you call, uh, you're likely to be sent to any one of these areas, depending on your location. Again, you've already heard this, I'm not going to reiterate it, but follow the CDC guidelines, keep yourself protected. And we cover travel. Again, uh, this also is true for, for your faculty and instructors. Again, if you're a student that's planning to travel, that's uh, 
international, that is something we want to restrict. Uh, domestic business travel is highly discouraged and may get restricted if future circumstances warrant. Um, just to talk about learners that are not UTMB students. Visiting and international travelers or learners and visitors are suspended. So if you have colleagues that are overseas, that are from other institutions, that are planning to come here, you need to cancel those visits. You need to cancel those visits. Uh, if, they're on the, if they're on the plane or the boat or the train or whatever coming here, uh, and they come from one of these level two, level three areas, they will be put on uh, isolation, self-isolation for 14 days. So please be aware that we want to protect our student body, our faculty, and staff. So we need to have you follow these procedures. Thank you, sir. Felicia Evans uh, for the Center on Human Resources. Uh, Will Dupree here in the KXA and live studio. I'm going to interrupt just for one moment this town hall that's happening in Galveston at the University of Texas Medical Branch. We just wanted to pass along a bit of breaking news. Uh, the Harris County Public Health Department is reporting that there has been now a sixth confirmed case of the coronavirus in the Houston area. And again, this is a person that is tied to those other five cases. These six people all went on the same trip abroad to Egypt, and now they are officially confirmed as um, having contracted COVID-19. We had that updated information on our website, kxan.com. If you're watching us on Facebook right now, there is an updated link in the Facebook Live description box, so please look there. But once again, let's go back to Galveston and listen in to the talk that's happening there in this coronavirus town hall. Who is uh, returning from travel to an international destination will be required to be cleared by either employee health or um, student health. We've had some questions about whether or not this also extends to um, our contract workforce, and it does. And um, we are working to make sure that all of our contractors are also being monitored um, through this process. Um, for individuals who are returning from one of the CDC level two or three countries, and those are the five countries that you've all heard about up to this point, China, Italy, South Korea, Japan, and, um, and, and Iran. Um, we're, we're going to uh, require that those individuals uh, self-isolate. And it's more than just them being separated from others. It is a matter of if they reside in the same household as an individual who has recently traveled to one of those locations, they will be required to self-isolate. And as a part of that, we will be monitoring them um, twice daily. They'll have to report their health status for monitoring twice daily. So it's not just a matter of I'm a manager and I know that my employee traveled to Italy, so I'm telling them to stay home 14 days. You need to let employee health know, or you need to let student health know that you've had um, someone in your area travel to one of these locations so that they can be properly monitored through the established processes. So for employees, um, we are using uh, an app called REDCap to uh, have our employees uh, enter their symptoms twice a day. Um, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. and then employee health is following up with those individuals to make sure that their um, vitals are within normal ranges. Um, if there is a, a missed report, they're, they're following up to determine um, what's going on there. And then if someone does appear to be developing symptoms, providing guidance to that individual about how they can safely seek care. So like Dr. Kaiser mentioned, making sure that you know they're calling ahead to the clinic putting on a mask so that they are not transmitting uh, or virus shedding, I think is the term Dr. Mouton used, um, in, in route to that uh, location. Um, student health has a similar process. They are having um, the students call in either by phone or by Skype, and they will do the same type of monitoring, making sure uh, vitals are within normal ranges, uh, following up on missed reports, and then um, getting them connected safely with uh, care providers should they become symptomatic. 
Um, if an individual is required to self-isolate, you know, we've already received questions about what, what do I do with that person? Um, how is that person paid? Um, at this point, we are keeping individuals whole, uh, so they are getting paid, but we are asking that uh, individuals work from home. And that may require that um, managers and the employees think a little bit more broadly about what type of work can I do. So obviously if you have a bedside nurse, that individual may not um, be able, that, that individual is not going to be able to provide um, direct patient care. But are there other things that that employee could do? Uh, Post-discharge callbacks, develop patient education content, um, other pet projects that may have been put on a shelf because there was no resource to get it done, but it's work that absolutely needs to get done. So thinking about ways that we can leverage the knowledge and skills of um, an employee who is in self-isolation, I think it does a lot for their mental state um, in terms of being engaged and having something mean meaningful to do um, during that 14-day period. Um, and then obviously if it's not feasible for that to work, uh, uh, for working from home uh, to be the arrangement, then we're going to want to talk about what other al alternatives there are. You know, is it administrative leave? Is it having the person, you know, perform duties for another department? So you're going to partner with HR to, to work through that. Um, thinking more broadly, uh, you know, you've heard that things are, could potentially escalate in phases. So what we're, what we're asking for managers to do now as it relates to the many questions that we're getting about telecommuting and working from home is start to prepare. So each of you should already, um, if you haven't already, uh, completed your departmental business continuity plans. You need to work on those to address um, temporary telecommuting should the need arise. Um, be thinking about uh, what can I do today to prepare my staff for that. Many of our staff have never had a need to log in from home. So what type of access will they need? Um, what type of documents will they need to be able to access? You know, just recently in, um, I think it was last week's weekly relay, um, there was a note about the availability of OneDrive and SharePoint through apps that can be downloaded to your phone. So think about moving uh, documents and files to those um, vehicles so that employees can access those things remotely. Um, HR is working with IS to come up with some telecommuting resources like checklists and job aids that will help managers and employees be able to, um, to prepare for that so that if I'm, a, if I'm a manager who's never had an employee work from home, I may not even know where to start in terms of what access to request for that person. So we're gonna come up with some tools to help um, managers and employees get ready. And then you wanna do a test run. Try it out, make sure that things work before you need them to work. And as I had mentioned already, we need to be thinking creatively about the work assignment. So you have not been in a position to have to, to manage a remote workforce. And so you need to think about how you're going to structure the work to support the organizational needs um, should things escalate to the point of having large groups of employees working from home. One other thing that I wanted to touch on um, because I, I heard it in a couple of the comments was um, taking a look at our policies and procedures and finding ways that we can relax those um, to support this very changing situation. And so we will be pulling together a group of leaders from across the organization to help us work through that and what that may look like for us. We did something similar back in 2009 when H1N1 was, um, was um, a concern and was affecting our campus. And so, you know, we've done it before, so it's not like it's not something that we wouldn't do again. Thank you very much, Felicia. I appreciate your comments. Uh, now we come to the part of our program that's uh, very important, and that is to give our employees and our students and faculty an opportunity to ask questions that we may not have covered. Uh, there are microphones in both uh, uh, aisles, uh, well, all three aisles. Uh, they're no, not on the exterior sides, but if you come to the center aisle or the two side aisles uh, and uh, state your name, uh, area where you work, and your question. 
Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jim McKeith, and I'm in emergency medicine and the Antarctic support contract. And I did have a question about the clinical presentation. I was aware that most of the COVID-19 patients got sick day five to seven. But did I understand you that they don't present like the flu? They have fibromyalgias initially? What are the initial symptoms? So one thing is there's uh, not the best data on people who are very mildly ill because many of them have never been tested. And there's not been a lot of publications about people who are very minimally ill and yet test positive. What we do know is that in the series that have been reported, for example, where that graph came from was from China, and it was that people knew they were starting to be unwell with some kind of symptoms, and exactly which symptoms were not always made clear in these reports, but may have been upper respiratory symptoms, may have been a mild cough, mild fevers, and so on, but they became sick enough to realize they really needed to go to the hospital at five to seven days. And so in that sense, yes, it can start off as something very mild, and we really don't know the full spectrum. Can it just be the sniffles? Difference between pediatric and adult patients. So there's not been a lot of good, clear description on cases that don't fit the case definitions that depend on fever and cough. Because clearly there are people who are positive who don't fit those case definitions. To what extent they are likely to shed the virus and transmit is also very unclear because if you are mildly ill but have a very runny nose full of virus, you might transmit a lot. Whereas if you don't have a runny nose uh, and you're somebody who keeps their hands away from their face and doesn't spread saliva around and lick their hands before they shake people's hands and so on, um, then you may not be somebody who transmits. So there's, there's an assortment of things there that we don't really know. But yes, mild symptoms certainly could be possible. OK, and if I could follow up, is someone who presents with classic flu, I'm fine, suddenly I have myalgias and fever, does that exclude COVID-19? Absolutely not. It, no, let me let me let me just just follow up on that. So right now, if someone has classic flu and no epidemiologic link and a positive flu test, we are probably not going to consider that person a, a COVID-19. That being said, there have been cases of people having dual infection. And so as we start having community acquired cases, that will change. But today, right now, you're probably okay if it looks like the flu and you got the diagnosis for the flu and you've got nothing to link them to anyone else, it's probably flu. And I just want to add one more thing. If for any reason you have not yet gotten your flu vaccine, <laughs> get it now, okay? Two reasons. You don't want to be locked up while you get tested. It's inconvenient for you. Well, three reasons. Second reason is it's really inconvenient for us when you show up with the flu and take up our resources. And third reason is we don't know yet, but it might be a lot worse to have both. Let's take a question on this aisle. My name is Gerard Coleman. I'm an engineering professor at Texas A&M Galveston. And uh, there has been corroborating evidence that the virus started in Saudi Arabia, was brought to Canada, and then was stolen into China. What evidence is there that this leak is not from an animal, but rather was a or a deliberate leak? Yeah, the, this is Jim Levin. Um, there's been a, a lot of speculation on the internet about uh, sources of virus. I think uh, the, the scientific basis is quite clear that these viruses exist in nature, that it's almost certainly came from a wild animal source. Uh, the, epidemiologically, it's very similar in origin to what we saw with SARS, uh, starting with the uh, exposure to wild animal markets. So I think the easiest and most logical explanation is that in fact it uh, originated from a wild animal and jumped to humans and has the ability to be transmitted uh, human to human. So uh, there, there's a lot of these rumors and stories, but uh, I think the scientific evidence is quite clear that uh, this originated from a wild animal. We're going to hop back to the center aisle. Hello, my name is Zilfia Wheat. I'm not an employee here. I'm 
I'm not a student, I'm not a teacher, I'm a retired news fanatic. So, <laughs> little, you know, a little bit concerned. Uh, let's discuss pre-existing conditions. I'm not sure if that was synonymous with comorbidities up there, yeah. Yeah. but pre-existing conditions. I hear daily diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. So uh, with those pre-existing conditions, uh, international travel, would that be discouraged? And I guess the next question would be, if someone does get to that severe stage, well, when they're not severe, you all saying, hey, you know, wash your hands, stay away from people. But how are you treated in the hospital if you do get to that severe stage? But the first question is that international travel. Sure. So I think you're absolutely right. The, the comorbidities mean pre-existing conditions. So diabetes, hypertension, underlying lung disease, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, these are the patients that are known to have high risk. And immunocompromised hosts, such as transplant organ recipients and patients with ongoing chemotherapy use, those are at high risk for uh, having poor outcomes. So I think it all depends upon the risk that you are taking. So we already know that uh, it is epidemic in those five countries. There's a travel ban. And I would encourage that if it is not necessary, just stay put where you are for the next three to four months until we have clear understanding about this virus. So um, I'll address a little bit more. So in addition to those risk factors, not yet really reported yet, and partly because many investigators don't report it, but obesity is likely to be an independent risk factor, although it is also associated with those other risk factors. Smoking. So there's things that one can do. Quit smoking right now uh, is something you can do. Um, but uh, all of those are important. Those, those are, are showing up uh, as well. So in terms of your travel, you need to make an independent decision, you know, barring the public health issues of whether or not you're allowed to travel. Whether or not you choose to travel is a decision you should make with your physician thinking about your own risk factors and about the medical care that's accessible in other countries or in the places where you may wish to travel. So in terms of management, um, you, you just uh, you ask about you know, when you get seriously ill. So when you look at all the information, there are about out of 100 people who got sick with this, about four to five who will get really sick. Really sick mean that they will need an intensive care unit and you can start with supplement oxygen uh, if they have difficulty breathing and if your oxygen level is low. Then you may have to put them on a ventilator, put a tube in the throat and have a respirator that breathe. And sometimes you are made it not able to oxygenate with that individual with just a ventilator and you have to put a cannula in the large artery or your vein and have a pump outside that will help oxygenate the blood, which is called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. So there are individuals in different parts of the world that have gone through ECMO as a last resort for oxygenation. Most of the deaths that are occurring is your response to the virus. You know, the body's immune system is the one that kills other organs because they're trying to kill virus. As they're trying to kill virus, they don't differentiate with that whether this kidney is mine or the liver is mine. They just start killing everything. And once you have multi-organ failure, those are the patients who are actually dying with this illness and during their terminal stages. Thank you. We'll come back to this. Uh, Dr. Clark. Hi, Dr. Clark. And in turn, it's see my over here at UTB. So for those patients or, or travelers who, who want to do the air travel, what's the recommendation on masks? There, there is currently no recommendation to wear a mask, although the CDC does say you shouldn't sit within six feet of someone who has it. So um, <laughs> and anyway, it's, it's an evolving situation. Masks generally are not helpful. This is not airborne. All right. This is not something that's floating around in the air. This is something where little balls of mucus gets coughed out. We touch it. We put it in our nose. We put it in our eyes. That's the main, main way. So masks generally are not very helpful in helping prevent it. We'll go over to the center aisle again. Hi there. My name is Andrew Merrill. I'm a first year medical student here at UTMB. Um, I have kind of two questions. One is for more information on the two different types of uh, COVID, you said L and S, I think, something like that. The second is, kind of as a student, 
Can you go elaborate more into what the policies right now look like for domestic travel, for a conference, for personal travel? What does that look like? Sure. This, this whole idea about SNL form just came to our notice just two days ago. Um, so what happened here was when they start looking at why the strain in Wuhan was so infectious compared to the strain in other areas, they found out that the early on in Wuhan was L strain, 70% was L, 30% was S. The L strain was causing serious diseases. That's why you see a lot of hospitalization, a lot of deaths. As time goes by, the S strain has increased, the L strain is lower. Outside of Wuhan or outside of China, the most strain that is circulating is currently S strain. Now you can have L and S strain. We don't know whether the vaccination with L or S, you have to separate that out or one is going to protect the other. So it is just a new information that just came out. You had one other uh, part of your question, Andrew, right, about yes, student travel. Yes, in relation travel. to domestic travel, what's the current policy? I know you mentioned some forms to fill out for things, and just like you know, conferences, I guess, on one side, and then more for personal travel. How does that Well, again, we, we want to be tracking your travel. So, again, notify your, your individual schools. Uh, if you're going to be travel, uh, again, we have a ban on international travel, and, the, and if you happen to be there and coming back, then you're going to be on self-isolation 14 days. Uh, again, use discretion. We're, we're asking you not to travel at all, if possible. So our recommendation is not to travel. Um, again, uh, particularly air travel. So our, our recommendation is not to, but if you are, you need to be letting your, your various schools know. Okay. And that includes personal travel? Including personal travel. Thank you. Dr. Rex McClellan from <laughs> McCallum, yeah. I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> Rex McCallum, and I'm the Chief Physician Executive of Artifactic Group of Practice. So um, I have two questions. One, would one of the panelists please comment on the demographics of, uh, you sort of touched on this with the comorbidity and other complicating factors, but what is the demographic of the people who are most likely to have a uh, serious illness and morbidity with the COVID-19, number one. And number two, uh, I, I wanted a question for Dr. Mouton, uh, is um, I believe that, uh, do, we not, do we not wish that the students, if they do get sick and call student help, that they call student help before they go someplace? Is that not correct, sir? Yes, we want you to call student health I'll call your, again, if you call your social assistant dean, they're going to have you call student health. But call right. student health. Um, they will, again, be the initial point of entry. Um, we don't want you going to student health. So once you're calling in advance, they will instruct you on if you need to go to be evaluated, where to go to be evaluated, or instruct you what to do and monitor you during the self-isolation period. Thank you. So Rex, to answer <clears throat> your first question, so there is um, a risk of mortality as you get older. So most of the deaths are occurring in individuals 70 years and above. So there's a, when you look into the risk of deaths less than 30 is 0.1, 0.2%. So as you get older, it just keeps adding up. So age is a significant risk factor in terms of death in this illness. Dr. Sharma, may I ask you also, uh, not only should the students call ahead, but we would encourage our patients to all call ahead so that you will show up in the right clinic that can administer the appropriate screening. Thank you, Dr. Raymer, for that. So what we decided for the health system, as you know, we have 90 different locations or 90 different clinic sites, and it's all over. So I don't want patients to be showing up in the psychiatric clinic for getting a flu test. We don't even have thermometers in those clinics to even get your temperature. So what we decided that we are going to have six clinics, and Dr. Mouton actually showed that in his slide, and we are going to update our website, and those six clinics will be listed. The reason is still flu is epidemic in this area. So before we even go to COVID-19, every patient with flu-like symptoms is going to get a flu test first. 
So we want to make sure you go to a clinic site where we have those equipment. So once you get your flu test, then we can decide whether you are a candidate to be tested for COVID-19 or hospitalization. So we are actually also sending information to all of our EMS within the area for our regional hospital. Please call ahead if you have any patients that you are bringing to our facilities who have respiratory illnesses, put a surgical mask on that patient and call ahead. When you bring in the patient, we will be ready and we're gonna put that patient in the negative pressure room and our mm -hmm. nurses and healthcare provider will have proper PPE to go and um, get the history from that individual and do the preliminary testing. So that's one of the things we are monitoring and we are deploying throughout our uh, health system. We have plenty of PPE, we have plenty of masks, we have plenty of supplies. I think we just want to be judicious how we are using it and deploying it throughout the health system. Middle aisle. Uh, my name is Synthal uh, I'm in. I'm with the Department of Physician Assistant Studies. Uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Raymer, for having this town hall. And I, I've got a couple of questions. If you want, do you want me to limit it uh, or just, just ask for it? Just, just go ahead and ask. All right. Um, uh, the first question is, uh, this PowerPoint, is it going to be available on the UTMB website? Yes, it will. Yeah. Um, all right. My first question is, uh, Suppose someone has the COVID-19 virus, you know, like uh, they're at home, they'll, they'll eventually recover. What are, they, what are they gonna need to do to come back to work? Uh, are they need to go, like, go see a physician, get a physician clearance? Uh, are they gonna need to come back wearing a mask? Uh, if, if, if someone has a diagnosis of COVID-19, then they'll become, they'll, they'll fall under the health department jurisdiction and then we will monitor them and then we will give them a release as to when they can, uh, when they can go home. Um, and what most places are doing is looking to see if they have two negative tests um, to, to allow them to go back to uh, work or to you know, go back around their, their normal duties. We're gonna have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But initially, if someone actually is diagnosed, we will isolate them and we will put them under an, a, uh, an order to stay home. And then they will have to stay home and then we'll release them when when everyone's satisfied that it's okay for them to go back to work. Right. Uh, my next question is, there was that slide where you showed the six, six clinics. Are those clinics equipped? You know, I imagine over time there might be like quite a few cases of, or potential cases of COVID-19 coming to those clinics. Are they equipped to like test all those patients or is, is, is there like a potential like limit on the number of tests? So I want to make sure everybody understand we do not have point of care testing for COVID-19. So please don't go to the clinic testing for asking for COVID-19 test. Only test that is gonna be happening in this clinic is flu test. So we want to make sure we test for flu and then we can work with our health authorities to see if you need to be tested for COVID-19. So it could change next week if we have point of care testing available and we can start screening individuals and more to come on that side. We are actually developing a plan that if we have a point of care testing available in this health system, we will deploy it in one area where anybody can get screened. So, but that is not there yet. Only thing in these clinics, there is plenty of PPE, plenty of flu testing capability to get that done in these six clinics. You know, we Americans are used to things going at a, a real fast pace, aren't we? Okay. So uh, it's kind of hard for us to understand that there, can't, there is not a current COVID-19 test because this started back in January, right? So uh, we expect things to happen quicker than that. But Dr. Xi and his colleagues only got samples of this virus legitimately in the last several weeks. And they're one of the foremost laboratories in the entire United States that come up with these rapid tests. So he has the platforms and everything to do that kind of development, but it can't be done overnight. We wish it could. The same is true of the vaccine. Uh, they have the platform for development of that, but it is taking some time. Uh, and we appreciate the work that uh, Dr. Xi and all the, the research uh, individuals over in our Galveston National Laboratory uh, are doing the hours they're putting in day and night to break the code on this. 
But uh, as Americans, we're wondering, you know, I go to the bathroom, not me, but someone can go to the bathroom and get a pregnancy test immediately. Why can't we do that with COVID-19? Well, you know, it's not available yet, guys. We're going to have to wait and be patient. What can you do in the meantime? You don't leave with anything else. You should leave with, I can wash my hands. I can take care of the copious amounts of drainage from my nose. I can get a flu shot. I mean, all those things that have been mentioned, those are prevention tools. And meanwhile, we're going to do a lot of hope and prayer for this team of scientists who are working around the clock to give us the, the kind of tools that we need to work with. Okay. Just one last question. Uh, I think there was a previous slide about using a disinfectant spray, but you know, of course, I think disinfectant sprays vary as far as their quality. I know as far as like the hand sanitizer, I think it was like saying 60% alcohol right. hand sanitizer. Is there anything specific to maybe look for like in a disinfectant spray? Um, there are some that are labeled specifically that kills coronavirus. That's one issue. But we would recommend soap and water. I mean, it's, it, it works. And so if you can't get a hand sanitizer, wash your hands. Wash down surfaces with soap and water. Make sure they're very clean and dry them off, and it should be all right. And actually, CDC has created a list of all the disinfectant, and we will be uploading into our website. But for our healthcare system, our clinics and hospitals, we do have the existing sanitizers are perfectly fine for coronavirus. So We're going to switch over to this aisle for our next question. Thank you. Hi, well, I wanted to, um, to ask a question back to testing, I would say. Sure. Uh, Dr. Frank, Department of Radiology, uh, Director of Cardiothoracic Imaging. So my question is, we anticipate um, increased utilization of imaging uh, with this outbreak. Um, no matter if we have it in the community and how wide we have it in the community, the anxiety level in the community is high, and as there's emerging data with multiple publications that are getting more and more, we're seeing more and more publications in the leading journal, journals such as Radiology, Lancet, American College of Cardiology, etc. And uh, uh, these are all describing very high sensitivity of imaging, and particularly chest CT. Um, and those images are everywhere, so including CNN. You probably all saw this, uh, um, uh, this interview with Mount Sinai, a cardiothoracic radiologist as well. My question is, are we prepared for that? What is the process in, of, in, in utilization of a chest CT? Because when we call it positive, what should we do? Sure, so I'll take that. So whenever you develop a test, you need a gold standard. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have a good gold standard. If you even look at the PCR, its sensitivity is only 70%. Okay, and the test sensitivity is dependent upon prevalence of a disease. So if you're doing in Wuhan, you are great. You can do CT scans, you can do PCR, it's going to work just fine. When the prevalence of a disease is low, I think it is very hard for us whether that test is going to be reliable to make a diagnosis. But we are working on that. I think the CT does play a role. There is a nice ground glass that they are showing in peripheral lung zones in terms of patients who are uh, infected with coronavirus. And, and I think we are working on within the health system. If it comes to that point, if it is an epidemic, I think we can look into that. The challenge for me is we are having some imaging read that consider coronavirus. I think we need to refrain from that. At present, the only way we're going to make diagnosis in U.S. is getting this test, the PCR, RT-PCR done through state authorities or through CDC or over local tests. But more to come on that. But thank you for asking for that question. Thank you. We're back to uh, the center aisle. Leanne Green, I'm with the McGovern Academy. Uh, maybe Dr. Mouton can answer this question from an admin standpoint and as an admin person who processes travel reimbursements. Um, we have students who are currently on a conference trip and they have already, you know, put money out after the announcement yesterday about your suggestion not to travel domestically. Do we just carry on as usual with processing their reimbursements? Um, we'll be working from the provost's office with the AE Travel Center for 
those trips that were canceled, we, we were working and figuring out how we can do adequate reimbursement for those. Uh, again, I'm assuming that they were approved preliminarily to do so. Um, again, uh, anything that has adversely affected individuals travel that has already been processed, we will work through that process to get them reimbursed. And so for future conferences, like They shouldn't be doing it for future conferences. We just talked about that. So, but if they get um, clarification from the president's office or their school to travel? And then it would be the normal process. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Nasir Hussain. I'm a primary care internist in Texas City, one of those listed on, uh, on the screen. My question is, what are we doing to provide telehealth services to keep these uh, upper respiratory infection patients where they are rather than even come to a clinic and spread it more? I'm going to uh, venture out and take that one myself, if I may. Uh, we, we are looking at the opportunities there. Right now, our telehealth is going to be restricted mainly to our, uh, our nurse triage lines and those kinds of things uh, only. Uh, I think most of our clinicians have agreed right now uh, that definitive examination with the tools that we currently have are not going to uh, provide any of us with the comfort level that we would be in treating the individual. Mainly because if they have those symptoms, they're going to need to be screened for the flu anyway. So uh, the first order of business will really be the nurse triage line uh, that we have and a request uh, coming in if they need screening would be done in person. Now, there will be other areas and hard to reach uh, places. We are cooperating with UT System on developing some rural health access and things like that that will provide support a different way that may in fact be uh, with video imaging also and the appropriate uh, medical equipment also combined. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm one of the nurse case managers here at UTMD. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. My first one is because of when we do education with our patients, um, I get this one. We have a reinfection rate with this virus that has been rather unusual, and I get a lot of questions about that that I really don't know how to answer. Is there anything that we can say to people right now to educate on this subject? So I think it is difficult to understand whether it is reinfection or ongoing carrier state, or you are getting reinfected. You originally had L and now you have S isoform. So I think it is difficult and too preliminary for us to see that whether you are persistently infected with coronavirus or is truly a reinfection. Okay. Uh, my second question is, and this goes to something that was said earlier, I think that it's difficult for the lay public to understand why when we say that it's not useful for them to wear masks yet, most of our providers do so. Is there some kind of provider information that we could link out, any kind of a video to explain this in detail, why we would need to limit their use as opposed to ours? Actually, there's a cute little short, if you look up KHOU of me explaining exactly okay. uh, some of those reasons <laughs> why wearing a mask is, is not helpful. A mask is very helpful for somebody who is coughing to prevent Correct. them from expelling it, okay? Which is why I'm wearing this one. <laughs> okay. And, and the only thing is, um, you might consider going home now. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and I promise you, you'll get leave. I have to offer not leave. They promise that you'll get leave. Okay. So, um, but, but, but the re so, so there is that short little video that it actually kind of captured it, and that's the one they put online, so if you do... Uh, KHOU coronavirus or UTMB it pops up pretty quick. But um, again, it's, it's the very concept that if you think that you're protecting yourself from yeah. what's outside, then you have to assume the outside of your mask is contaminated. Exactly. Very few people think about that mm -hmm. and they end up putting their hands on their mask. They also have to readjust it a little bit and then they're going to rub their eye and of course they're not at all protected from somebody coughing in their eye uh, or any little floating thingies that may or may not exist getting into their eye. So, um, and, and actually one of my, my 
team took a picture of somebody on an airplane watching her with her N95 mask on, and this was even a week or so ago, as she kind of pulled it down to drink her coffee and shoved it back <laughs> up, and then yeah. put on some makeup, and then took it off and chucked it, chucked it into her purse, and then put it back on, and, and all of those, uh, if you're Ebola trained, would just be striking absolute terror into your heart. So, uh, so uh, we try to explain that. And, and then, of course, the other reason is that you really want your care provider, who's at much higher risk mm -hmm. of being coughed in the face and so on, to have access to these masks. Mm -hmm. So uh, because if you come in with a broken leg, you don't want your care provider to actually be carrying coronavirus and give you coronavirus or anything else. So, um, so, so that's another reason. Is there any way we can get that link to the front page of our website? Because, like I said, I don't have time as I'm sitting at bedside to explain in graphic detail most of the time. But if we could get that an easy yeah. link to so we, So we're going to do that. So just focus on that COVID-19 website we are creating internally. Mm -hmm. We're going to li link everything there. And all the questions that you have already sent us, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to actually answer each one of them, and it will be there later today. Thank you. Let's go to the aisle here. Hi there, my name is Jenna neeson raisin I'm a fourth year medical student. Um, we, we're both fourth year medical students. We'd just like to clarify a couple of things. First, are there any changes as far as the match day ceremony that's happening in a couple of weeks? I've heard from other schools, there's comments. So at this point, we would, we're, we're gonna be limiting match day to the students themselves. Where the families, particularly those that are gonna be traveling from out of town, where uh, trying to limit visitors to campus. Um, as much as it pains us to do so, again, given this concern, we want to limit as, min as much as possible individuals coming to campus uh, and then ex getting exposed or exposing, potentially exposing students. So we're going to limit mass data just to students. It's going to be videotaped and simulcast uh, so they can view online. What about graduation? Uh, graduation, at this point, we don't have any plans to uh, change anything with that, but that's fluid. And so, um, at this point, we'll have to see if the, uh, if COVID-19 becomes epidemic here in this region, then it may change. So, that's going to be a fluid situation. We have not made a determination on that. Uh, we hope not to have to face that, but if it comes to it, we will, and we'll let all the graduates know. Okay, and then just to clarify, again, it sound, sorry to sound like a broken record about travel, but most of our class has post-match day international travel plans, so is that a hard no from the administration, or is that a discouraged <laughs> no? <laughs> and quarantine as well. Uh, again, if you want to run into a volcano that's, you know, erupting, you can, you can certainly do so. <laughs> but we are not going to say we have permission to do so. The answer is we are saying no international travel. Now, again, I'm not going to be at the airport, you know, <laughs> pulling you off the planes. But please be aware, if you do so, you will come back and we will have you on a 13-day isolation. Also, okay. keep in mind that if you go somewhere, you may not get back. You may be quarantined there or you may be denied access, well, U.S. citizens will not be denied access at the border. People with green cards might be denied access at the border. And U.S. citizens may be put into quarantine under the feds. And they're not fooling around. So um, I would strongly reconsider what you're doing. We'll pass that on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, yeah, we have Chris. a couple more questions uh, over here. Yeah, Chris with the uh, media relations. Got a question from social media, actually. Uh, what, uh, what should regular patients come to UTMB for a routine, whether it's surgery or doctor's visit? Do they have anything to worry about? Do they need to take any precautions? So I think one of the things we, we have here is, which is unique, that our biocontainment unit is very differently located in terms of where we do our routine patient care. So it is right next to our emergency department. We have six contiguous negative pressure rooms in one area. That is why we are using that to take care of patients who are positive for coronavirus and they will have no contact to rest of our patients who are admitted throughout our health system or hospital. So people should feel safe for their regular procedure or regular surgeries that they have scheduled 
that we will provide safe care here in, uh, throughout our health system. Let me also reiterate, there are no cases in Galveston County, okay? So that means if they come to the hospital, they're not likely to see one. And as I said before, I'm confident that with all the preparation that we've done, as well as the run-throughs we've done with the patients, that at least in the short term, we can adequately separate people who potentially could be infected from the rest of the general population. So we don't want the general population to worry, oh, I can't go to the doctor because something bad might happen to me. Right now, I think it's going to be fine. Dr. Townsend. I'm Courtney Townsend from surgery. Will the COVID-19 uh, website be available for the public or will it be limited to the internet and you have to be on the network? So we actually did it, made, made it external. So anybody can access it, www.utmb.com slash or .edu slash COVID-19. So anybody can access it. It's not intranet anymore. Hello. I have a question about being a mother. So for our children, I mean, my kids aren't hand sanitizing and washing in the 20 seconds and all that. So how concerned are we for them? So the good news is that children have not been adversely affected. Unlike flu, which has a high mortality rate among kids, and it, there, to date, there have been no kids under 10 that have been reported to die. Right. And, the, and the death rate among children is about 0.1.2%. So that means I'm 99.8% 99 confident they'll be okay. The death rate increases once you start getting to be 50, 60, 70, 80. That's where it really starts to go up. Okay, great. And then my other question, which is the last one, is, is one symptom alone with travel a concern to report? Like, I just have a cough and I was recently... So we would have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the answer is, is that, you know, one symptom of travel is probably not that concerning the more you have. I mean, we're, we're getting these questions all the time, and they're tough. And so what we have to do is look at each case individually and really drill down to the details of both the travel, where the travel was, and what symptoms uh, the person has uh, presenting with before we make that determination whether it's concerning. Okay, Dr. and then Patel. as far as symptoms with the fevers, I know y'all said at the second week is when you do see that it's continuing, which is different than the flu. Is the fever lasting every day up until they recover? Like, yes, okay. <laughs> so, so that particular study was in Lancet early this month. And what they were looking at, the patients who were hospitalized in that hospital, they follow them backwards when their symptoms started, when with potential exposure. That is the best data we have in terms of how this illness trajectory is. Now, not everybody follows that trajectory. So I would caution you in terms of that you let go first week and the, now symptoms are worsening in the second week, then we need to take care. So I think we just need to look at an individual case and then address that at that time. So four of us meet on a regular basis, three to four times a day. We review cases that are sent to us and we make a decision what is the right step for that particular patient. Okay, thank you. And just one Dr. more thing. Dr. Patel, uh, one question that ties into hers. Dr. Patel, you wanna mention uh, COVID-19 and pregnant women. Sure, okay, so we actually don't know enough about it, which is probably good news. Because, um, you know, we've had thousands of uh, positive cases in China and not much has come out about how severe it is in pregnant women. But compared to other coronaviruses that we know, including SARS and MERS and all that, they could have slightly increased uh, morbidity from it. And so we are going to advise caution, you know, pregnant healthcare workers probably will not be taking care of, you know, COVID-19 patients. Um, they may deliver babies a little bit prematurely. That's the only thing we know so far from the current outbreak, okay? And transmission of infection from mom to the baby is a rare event, but it can happen. And most of it probably happens after delivery, although one cannot rule out congenital, you know, in, while the baby is still in the womb to be infected. So the, the babies who have been exposed, some have been diagnosed, they have done very well, so that's the good news is not found in breast milk, so that's the good news. They can continue to breastfeed. But again, if a pregnant woman comes into the hospital, confirmed with 
COVID-19, we have developed a protocol just as of yesterday, actually. And so, the, you know, mothers and the babies will be separated in the beginning, and then, you know, uh, we'll work up the baby to see babies already infected at delivery, and then we'll keep them separate, and when to reunite them, again, it's going to be case by case, you know, basis, and we'll, we'll determine when is best and safe time to do that. We'll mirror the flu policy we already have for pregnant women. But again, we are going to be a little bit cautious with pregnant women because they do have higher morbidity from other viral infections. But right now, they, among the comorbid factors we are talking about earlier on, pregnancy does not s seem to stand out as much. So that's, that's the reassurance we have so far. Susan? I just do want to say one th more thing about the, the pediatric issue in terms of getting very ill versus getting it and transmitting it. So what we yeah. are seeing is that there is no evidence that children get severely ill from it on a routine basis. However, they can get it, and it does seem they may have a higher proportion of upper respiratory symptoms, runny noses, so they may be important in transmitting.